recording before I do screen share. I think I do. Okay. It says recording now. Good. Okay. So we're on class seven and this is going to be talking about um, more GIS and R. We're going to work with Leaflet, a couple other packages and some different APIs for pulling GIS data. And uh, let's see. I'll start screen sharing. I'll pull up the agenda quick. Could okay. I ask a question about assignment four? Yeah, let's let's start there. Do you guys want to start with talking about like assignment four and like the final project and stuff? Does that work? Oh sure. I sure. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. What's your what's your question? Uh, now I I have been searching around the web looking for something interesting and I can't find anything where they they provide the code. Uh, is it okay to find an example in a uh, a book, for oh. example? Yeah. I have, I have a number of R reference books. I haven't looked through them yet, but I'm sure some of them have some uh, interesting examples that would be suitable. Yeah. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, I'll I'll pull up. Um, so I think some people were having trouble finding the. I wanted to do it on the discussion post because I thought that'd be a good format for people to take a look at them. So um, hopefully you're able to see. Oh yeah, I think there's been two posts. Well, one of them might have been me. Yeah, um, where I put the assignment for instructions link there. Um, just talking about like, and there's also this R bloggers list that um, has a lot of different examples. Um, let me just make sure that still looks good. Yeah, okay. Sometimes they, the links change. Um, but yeah, so that was just like sort of a starting point if you just didn't know where you wanted to start. But I think a book would be, would be cool. Um, I have this like, this, this book with some great examples called A Primer in Ecology for R. And he like codes in this really old kind of base R way. Um, and does a lot of calculus with R. So like that's an example of like a, a book that might have some cool like real world applications. But um, Alyssa, can I, can I talk about yours? Yours is so much fun. So yeah, so Alyssa po already posted um, her assignment four and um, it's really cool. Actually, I think I already pulled it up and loaded it. There we go. Um, but it's this sort of paranormal activity in the British Isles um, and people mapping that and some cryptozoology stuff like people seeing large cats and um, what's this one? Yeah, this is like one of the, the, the more like random ones I've seen and it's so neat. And I really like this, um, this base map that they're using or this like aesthetic they're using with like parchment. It almost looks like parchment paper uh, it's really cool. Let's see, density of paranormal manifestations, which probably kind of like corresponds with um, population density, I would bet. Um, and then they had the R code, which is really nice. And, um, and Alyssa talked about some of the packages that were used and stuff. Uh, some of these we're going to use today, like raster. Uh, we're going to take a look at that. Um, we're going to use S, we're going to use SP, which is kind of like SF. Um, so, yeah. Um, so that that's just sort of like an example of what we're looking for here. And you can post it as a reply to my discussion post, like just click reply. Um, and we'll get kind of a list of them going here and you can kind of click through them and check them out. It's, it's not intended to be, um, it's more of an exploratory assignment. So uh, we used to have during this class people would present in person when we did this class in person and it was kind of fun, but um, obviously like that would be hard to do now. So um, we'll just do discussion post instead and maybe this class won't be as long. But yeah, so any more questions about assignment four? So when we want to write up our discussion, this is where we do it? Or yeah. Yep. Like when you write up that like paragraph or like a hundred words or something um, about the analysis, like just include a link and um, Alyssa kind of talks about the different plots they used and stuff like what, what tools went into it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, not much. Um, 
some people might have a, like an image to insert in there. Um, I'm not sure. Does discussion let you put images in? Probably. But I don't know if you can attach doc. Yeah, you could attach documents and stuff too in there. So, you know, whatever Maria, you need. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if I was able to get mine in there. Could you check and see? I did see. Um, I don't see it in here, but like I did see that you submitted something. So like if I go to my home. I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to post that. Yeah, so here it's like it showed up here. Um, so like it, it went somewhere and I was able to look at it so I could post it under discussions if you want. Um, but it's just uh, under discussions. Sorry, what? That would be great if you could do that. Thank you, because I, I, uh, I mean, I normally don't have so much trouble figuring this stuff out, but I, I couldn't for the life of me. It's it. kind of hidden because, like, they put all of this. Um, I, I feel like Canvas puts a ton of like widgets and clickable things <laughs> everywhere, and so it's hard to actually see like what, you know, what is there. I don't know. That's just my personal beef with canvas could, i don't i didn't even see i i uh didn't even know where to start could you kind of just show us how to do that i mean it seems like yeah. a thing to trip over but but i i wasn't able to, to do it yeah okay so i went to the discussions tab on the left um here and then the first when i first posted the instructions um, under discussions, I forgot to click the publish button. So like if you were in there at that point, you might not have seen it. Um, and so I, I published it and um, then click into that assignment number four, our powered analysis visualization. Um, and I've linked to the instructions and stuff, uh, but under where it says post assignment number four here, you can just click reply. And then it lets you fill in, upload stuff and yeah. But it could have been when you looked, I had forgotten to uh, click the no, publish. You, no, even, even after you uh, had mentioned that you had forgotten to publish it, I went back and I, I couldn't figure it out. I, hitting that reply was, I think, the thing that opens the window. That I oh, think. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I can show yours, though, uh, just because it, it's got a cool visualization here. Yeah, it is. But... Yeah. So this is GDP data. Um, yeah, each of the states GDP is listed on that spiral. The inner part is the smaller GDP. Oh. States get larger GDPs, it spirals out like a snail. So you can see California is 2.734 billion. You know, that is really cool. But then what they do is they, the red is the percentage of their GDP that comes from international trade. Oh. So Minnesota, Minnesota is uh, kind of in the middle there. The 14% of Minnesota's GDP comes from international trade. That's really cool. Man, like, what is it? What, they use ggplot and four cats. Okay. Yeah. This is neat. I, I'm like imagining now, oh, this would be so cool as like, since, well, since I work with like insects, but like the different insect families and proportionally like how many there are, like number of species. I don't know, I just feel like there could be a really cool graph like that. Oh, that's so neat. I love it. Cool. Yeah, I can post, I can put that under the, um, the discussion board a little bit later. So, so, so you just hit, so basically you just hit reply when you were in that one screen and then you mm -hmm. just submit your text or uh, attachment and that's, um, yep. and then I think there was a submit button and then that's it. Yep. Yeah, just this like re weird long reply button that, um, it doesn't even look like a button. That's the thing. It's kind of weird. Okay. Oh yeah, and you're, it's kind of blocked. So, uh, let's see, yeah, post reply is the what you click. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, and I think technically there's like um, 
they like automatically generates like an ask ask the instructor um but discussion post as well no one's done that i would probably see it though if they q a yeah ask the instructor no one's used it for that but if you did post something there i'd i would see it um i don't know if i want let's see i don't want the window to get in the way of oh i see okay can you guys see the window of people's screens um when i share screen maybe well i mean i can i can see you and i can see um is it jim Glur? oh like I can, I can see her and then the others the rest of us are like blacked out like we can see our names yeah it's yeah so i'll just minimize it a little bit here and uh so it because i think last time it might have been getting away when i was doing the demos a bit um so are there any more questions about assignment four? Good. I'm starting to feel like I'm behind. <laughs> no, no, I, I just, I just posted at the end of last week and um, yeah. I was going to use some time today just to go over it anyway. So, um, but yeah, it was like really nice that um, Jim and Alyssa already had something submitted just so I could like have an example and um, and, and I have examples from last year, but they were given in presentation form. So, um, like they were, it was like a video in class. So maybe I'll make that available too, but it's kind of long to watch all of them. Um, so yeah, let's go to the, uh, the assignment or the final project um, and just have, just have a little class time where we talk about that, you know, if, in case you guys were looking it over and had any questions. I, think I posted it under the instructions under the halfway through the class or uh, class five there. Um, so this is really similar to, by design, it's kind of similar to like the setup of the invasive species assignment three, um, but with a, a different data set and letting you go a little bit more on your own as far as what data and analysis and how you choose to communicate it. Um, but it's still going to involve going to uh, the DNR, um, to getting a DNR data set, a shape file um, on the G Minnesota Geospatial Commons, this Emerald Dashboard Detection uh, folder. I think I already pulled it up. I'll just click on it again. Where did I pull it up already? Um, let's see. I know I pulled that up. Are we going to have any issues with the data like we did in assignment three as far as being able to access the Ooh. data like when we did read OGR and... Sorry, I just closed out of it. Um, yeah, so, oh, here we go. <laughs> um, so if you are, if you, I would go ahead and try. So a few people did have issues. Um, I think maybe like three people's systems had issues reading in the shape file. I would go ahead and try to read it in again with this data. Uh -huh. um, it's the EAB trees shape file that you need, um, or this shape file here. And, I would go ahead and try to download it, like it says in the instructions, um, you read it using the read OGR. And then if it gives you any issues, send, send me what you have, like the path you have and all that stuff. I might try to troubleshoot it a little more, even though um, I don't have Microsoft, I might be able to figure out what's going on. Uh, but if that still does, if I can't figure it out, then I'll get you the, which, whichever shape files you wanna need. You might have to think ahead a little bit and be like, oh, I know I want, um, I would like this shape file of uh, water features or parks or something, and I can get that for you and convert okay. it. Um, but yeah, I think I think I could still troubleshoot a little bit for those people who are having some issues because I've had like every issue there is to have with RG Dal it seems. <laughs> um, but so give it a shot and then let me know how it goes, okay. and I'll see what I can do. Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, are yeah. there are there alternatives to road read OGR? Mm. I'm going to say probably, but 
I noticed that there uh, a lot there is a library, and I forget if it was called uh, Simple Files. Mm -hmm. uh, that seemed to be capable of reading shape files. It has okay. some tools, but I haven't tested it yet. Right. I can't. I can't imagine that RGDAL is the only one. However, GDAL is like the the sort of the most used um, geodatabase extraction library. And its interface to R is probably like, uh, sadly, like the most um, tested, if that makes sense. Um, but which it still has issues because it's relatively uh, like R R wasn't used as a GIS um, until a little bit more recently, I feel like. But um, if you come across something and find that it's easier, definitely let me know. Or, um, okay. yeah, because uh, I don't, I don't, I haven't found anything easier. You know, I, I the the problem is I couldn't get it to uh, uh, consistently work, and uh, it uh, our would uh, our studio would uh, lose connection with the uh, the uh, GG plot two library, and I'd have mm. to reload the library. So it was acting like it's some some kind of memory management garbage collection issue. I I did discover there's a bunch of diagnostic tools in R for checking on uh, memory management. I haven't tested those either. So yep. yeah, that is that is exactly the the types of like limitations I run up against in R. Um, I think like is with working with GIS data is memory issues, especially with like raster data and reading it and also reading in shape files. Um, yeah, it seems to be like that's where the bottleneck is. And I don't know of a package that um, has like gotten around that bottleneck better. It was like arts, we kind of talked about like R being an interpreted language and it just, that seems to be the bottleneck for GIS data is where it runs into trouble is memory issues. Um, so, yeah, I know I've tried other ways of reading in shape files, but RGDAL is the, the one that I've gotten like the most consistent results from, but it's not the most, it's not always the most consistent. And that's why I say like for people having issues, uh, maybe try with this shape file. It might go better. It might be something that I can take a look at too. And uh, there might just be like something slightly different with how it interacts. Cause the, I think the problem is um, that like R runs on C and sometimes like I, I have issues with my RGDAL not agreeing with like the C compiler that's like in the background on your computer. I don't know, like that's, that seems to be like the issue I've run into, but I don't know C. Mark, do you, do, do you write in C? Uh, I did years ago. It's, it's uh, as one professor described it, it's an industrial strength language. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yes, I, uh, it was one of my favorite languages years ago, but I haven't had occasion to use it recently. Yeah, um, it was, it's, I think I was talking to someone in office hours and like, I think it came up and I said that like, based on like when I was reading your assignments and just like the style of coding you did, I was like, I'm going to ask Mark if he wrote C because like, I just, I just feel like you can, you can, you can see it. Um, I wish I knew C. I like that. It is kind of an industrial strength language. Uh, yeah, I wish it was more widely used. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I I uh, have coded in all the old languages, Fortran and COBOL, mm -hmm. PO1. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Like I was actually, I saw like not too long ago a job in COBOL, um, which because there's still so many systems that are still like operating on it, and they they need programmers. Um, to to including, run those yep including my federal agency and if i wanted mm -hmm. to be bumped up one grade uh i could take one of those jobs but uh the the cobalt coding and it it's mostly just maintenance at my agency it's it's so boring i'm willing to give up the extra seven thousand a year <laughs> yeah they'll pay a lot for it it's yeah <laughs> oh man that's cool though um, but yeah, like, <laughs> Mark, you might be the one to like figure out what's going on behind the scenes with RGDAL and 
our studio and how they're agreeing with each other because sometimes yeah. it requires some some C that I am not accustomed to. So, uh, if I have time, I will look into that in the next uh, couple weeks. But but yeah, like I can I can always um I I recently kind of went through and um, basically had to like change the C compiler. Um, that my Mac was using and RG Dell's working really well and stuff now. So if I need to convert things for you, if someone has like a shapefile that's not working, I can convert it for you. Um, anyway, um, and we'll, t we'll do a little bit more shapefiles tonight as well, in examples. Um, so, yes, yeah, so just, oh man, sometimes Canvas just, quits out of things for me. Um, but yeah, with the final project, it's going to involve, involve an R markdown file as like your final report. Um, but I also still want you to include your R script too, since, you know, uh, this Mary, is- Mary, I have another question about R markdown mm -hmm. reports. Uh, I looked around on the web and was looking for uh, a good model, and I really just couldn't, couldn't find good models of R markdown reports of how people, you know, compose them. Mm. It's, yeah, it's not very standardized. Um, I would say, hmm, let me, let me see if I can like pull up some resources on uh, like kind of best practices for our markdown. Was that kind of what you're looking for? Exactly, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, c I could try and do that. Cause like, it's mostly just like, you just like hear things and and incorporate it in your style as you go along but like for one thing i know that like um it's usually not best practice to have like uh install have it install packages right off the back on someone else's machine um or things like that so i can try and find some best practices or at least like at least i know there's probably something about like what the book thinks are best practices i mean these these writers uh, wrote a lot of the tidyverse, so um, they probably have opinions about it. Um, but yeah, I can see if I can pull up something on that. Um, yeah, that, that was kind of what I was alluding to earlier too when I was talking mm -hmm. about having to copy and paste the code into R Markdown because like some things you just could not break up, like they had to be together. And even if you had lines or more lines that you would have liked to have had together, yeah. I mean, thankfully, I, you know, I wrote comments to kind of. Well, I wrote comments, you know, to just sort of clarify it as best as possible. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, otherwise, you know, it's like you, you really sometimes you just really had to keep everything together, even if it was more lines than. Yeah, it's like you have to kind of think about like each chunk is its own little R environment um, yeah. running in the background, and then like so it's like whatever you need for that output that you want to visualize needs to go together in that code chunk. So it, it it's like a fun, it's like when you make your custom functions, you have to think ahead to what the output will be, mm -hmm. and and it gets it's kind of the wild west, I would say, like R Markdown uh, <laughs> formatting it. Um, it's still a little like I probably do things that aren't best practice, I would, I guess, but so it wouldn't be bad for me to, to see what people are converging on this year, you know, um, like, like this year I learned that the Palmer Penguins data set replaced Iris and uh, just, you know, stuff's changing in the R world. Um, so, yeah, so I, I mentioned that the shape file that you'll want is the EAB Emerald Dashboard Infested Trees um, in this Emerald Dashboard detection data from the DNR. And then it says you have to include the infested trees, but um, other layers you use are at your discretion. Um, and you can use outside data sources. Uh, let's see. I think I say... Did I mention how many visualizations to do? Because uh, I have people ask that a lot. Um, oh, a title, introductory paragraph, um, at least three code chunks that each render, like at, at least like three visualizations um, or a table or a you know, some something that visualizes the data. 
So like sort of three separate elements. I, I guess it doesn't have to be like with, with what we're talking about, it doesn't have to be three, like three code chunks, but, um, but if you're gonna do like three different outputs and visualizations, there'll be at least three of them. And yeah, and I've just made the final project due like that Tuesday. So our next class is the, uh, the class eight is the 20th. That's just online. And then like the following Tuesday is when I have this due. Um, Cause I need to have time to grade them, get the grades in before the semester is over or try quarter is over. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I hope it is. I do it. have a uh, re slightly relevant question. Sure. Now, when, when the Emerald Dash Four first hit the Twin Cities, I heard the estimate that there were a hundred million ash trees in Minnesota. Is that still ballpark of how many ash trees are in Minnesota? I don't know. Um, like you know who would have been a good person to ask because jake who did the his his uh masters was in emerald ash borer biocontrol so um he probably like i just kind of randomly picked it because like i wasn't gonna uh do something that was in my research area um because that would be kind of conflict of interest but um i yeah like i know there's been a huge push to get rid of lots of trees so i mean that might be something interesting to look at if there's um, some, you know, you can do this at whatever scale you want. It doesn't have to be Minnesota. People um, have gone into like different counties or even cities and looked at like the tree data or like the parks data there. Um, you could even look at, you know, what's, what's the risk going to be given like the change in ash trees from, you know, this year to that year. Because uh, I bet the city keeps geospatial records of that, I would imagine. Um, but yeah, like there's been a big push to get a look to to get rid of the ash trees once they show any sign of infection because it does not take long for like it it takes like less than two years for them to just be dead on the inside and start losing limbs. So um, and that's kind of part of the assignment too is just like to communicate like the urgency of this to stakeholders like using your our visualization skills because so many people get really up in arms about losing these trees. Um, and which is understandable, but, but like it is an urgent issue and we'll, we'll just lose more trees if we don't do something about it. So, um, it's becoming more of like a, you know, this isn't as hot a topic as it was a couple years ago when I started this project, cause it's just Emerald dashboard just continues to spread, but, um, it's still, it's still being found in new areas, like as recent as this year. So in Minnesota, but there is a, uh, uh, a, a professor at Wright State University who specializes in emerald ash borers, and he he says that it uh, it can spread to other trees too. And he he did list some of those other trees. Oh yeah, and it vectors a disease, I think. Um, pretty sure, and and. Uh, like I'm, I, I don't know how how many trees the disease can infect as well. So, yeah, I think I've had people do like as part of like this, they've done like a recommendation. Um, they they like kind of recommend what they think should be done, or like they'll say like replace it with these trees or whatever, um, and or replace ash trees with more of these trees or something like that. Um, maybe you don't you don't have to get like too far into the the life cycle and the research of emerald ash borer, but sometimes it kind of helps um, to figure out what data you want. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it's. Oh, I was just gonna ask, um, it looks like on the bottom there, according to that, that you want a written report as well? It's just in your R markdown, like in your, um, you know, like there's the markdown. When I say oh. like, it should contain like a, paragraph like I mean like literally like in the markdown report you'll have your title like a header um like a little paragraph about what you would recommend based on this visualization you know so oh okay yep. so this is part of the this is part of the r markdown mm -hmm. file yep oh, and that's okay. the advantage of using the dot rmd file is that you can like you don't have to turn in like a docx 
and your R script and be trying to say like, so you'll see from this line, you know, <laughs> and like trying to refer back to the .r file, like the .rmd like lets you put that all together really easily. Sure. Oh, okay. Okay. I was, I was thinking maybe you were thinking like Word document or something along those lines. No. Yeah. Um, just, just include. Yeah. And I've had, I have had people render it to a Word doc. You can do that. You do have to, I believe, install. Um, I mean, like you can render it to a PDF or HTML. Like I have that here pretty easily. Um, but I think you might have to install another package to render it to a Word doc, but you can do that. Oh, okay. I think it's Pandocs, which I think is also used for Python. Hmm. But yeah, so um, yeah, I always look forward to those. Um, it's kind of, yeah, I know it's insect related again. Um, you'll just sort of notice that you know, whoever's teaching your R class, you end up like working with a lot of data. It's specific to their field. Um, and as an example of, to that, I wanted to do like just a little review um, from previous classes, sort of a throwback here. So this was, an I had like, this was part of an assignment I had um, over a year ago for an advanced R class. And um, it was the, it was in the school of public health. Uh, so we had a lot of data from the CDC. So this was pulling um, the, some data off of a CDC website. And I already went ahead and pulled it, you know, reading it in and as a CSV file. But I wanted to show, show this data. Um, I think it was just that, did I already? <clears throat> I gotta read it in here. Um, it's kind of a big file, so it might take a second. Uh, but I wanted to highlight this data because um, this, I, I, I was assigned this before, um, or sorry, I was assigned this after I made assignments one and two for the class where you have to like remove the parentheses and stuff like that. And I got assigned this assignment like after it and it was almost the exact same process that we had to do. I don't even think the professor intended for it to be that way. It's just, it happened that the lat long data came in kind of funky. Um, I hope it reads in here. <laughs> Might take a minute. Uh, Oh my goodness. May I ask a semi-silly question? Go for it. Okay, the line about that URL CDC, where it has the um, hyperlink there? Yeah. Yeah, that is. When R reads that, I mean, does it op automatically open up a, um, like an HTML, you know, like a, like a web doc or the website itself? Yeah, it was, let's see. I guess I've never really seen a hyperlink before like that. Um, oh, did it do it? Oh, no. Oh, maybe, this is weird, it worked earlier. Sorry, I hope I didn't interrupt. Oh, no, I just uh, wanted to show this, but it, oh, maybe I needed to. Let me see if I can run it again. Um, yeah, it was, it was a um, a website, let me see if I can pull it up here, that like had these, I think it's formatted in a way that um, there's already like CSVs um, that it can pull. I think you could do this with like the raw CSV data from a GitHub or something like that. Let's just like paste it in. Maybe it's not there anymore. Maybe that's the issue I'm having, although I just did this yesterday. Uh, allow. Yeah, so it's just like the link to the download, which is, so like it just started downloading it as um, a CSV here. So you can put oh. in, you know what I mean? So you can okay. put that in as something to read, which is what I'm doing here. Um, and it's taking a second, cause like, I guess it's kind of big. And also I never account for the fact that when I have Zoom open, it takes longer to read things in, I feel like. Um, so maybe I won't get to, oh, dang it. Why is it doing this to me? I don't know. I was, 
I was going to show this, but um, I guess I can pull it in with I'll just pull it in with the download, maybe. So much for, there we go, okay. Yeah, it is kind of big, I guess, might be the issue. Okay, um, I'll try to show you what I'm, in this preview, what I'm going for here. Oh, here it is. Okay, so this was from the CDC website. Um, it's this huge data set they have on 500 cities and um, different conditions people have, like health risks they have um, based on location. And this geolocation, like take a look at these lat longs. I think I said when I was talking about assignment two um, that I see lat long data get pulled in like this all the time. So it's like, I, I think it gets pulled in off of like APIs online or something. Um, so it's like in these parentheses, it's maybe separated by a comma or something, but they put like the lat longs together. Um, so if I just go, here, I'll just go ahead and import it. It's kind of big. I swear it didn't take this long of yesterday when I downloaded it. Well, while it's doing that, I have a comment about assignment three. Mm -hmm. uh, among the weeds, I was able to choose field bindweed. Oh, yep, I, yep. Which I have been battling in my yard here for the last uh, 10 years. Oh, really? Uh, yes, the, uh, the, I believe the seeds for field bindweed came in in uh, bags of mulch. And oh, yep, yep. So it's, it's only in uh, one section of my yard, but it's it's an almost impossible to kill. Roundup, if, if, if you spray with Roundup, it'll kill uh, the part of the plant that comes in contact with the Roundup. It's very difficult to get all the roots, so it usually comes back, but if you keep pulling it, uh, for years, eventually the roots lose enough energy that they will not survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I <laughs> but, actually uh, um, know, I know people in Switzerland who are, um, and in Europe who are working on biocontrol agents for field bind weed that are very effective. I think they have like a little, a, um, I was like a lepidoptera. Why can't I think of the, like a moth? <laughs> there we go. And, um, uh, uh, leaf feeding beetle that like completely defoliates it I believe um but yeah like that one's that's like a big one that's that's pulling in some funding for biocontrol products or projects because it's really hard to control it with herbicide and manage it year to year but there's another invasive insect in this area Japanese beetles which uh uh devastated a number of plants. Apparently they have some favorites. I forget what they are, but uh, we had some of those plants in our yard and the Japanese beetles descended on them and uh, really devastated the plants. And I, I thought they might have actually been killed, but I noticed some of them are starting to come back this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That, that is one persistent weed. Um, so yeah, so I was able to read, just read in that CSV that downloaded. Um, and then for this assignment for this class, I really just did the same thing we did for assignment two um, and for assignment one to some extent as well, where I did the separate function and tidier, um, separating on that comma, because it always seems to come in with just the lat long separated by commas. Um, so that should have worked. And I'm like a little, 
worried by how slow my computer is being with Zoom open like this because we're going to be working with geospatial data today. So luckily I have it all typed up so you don't have to like watch me type it up. Um, but yeah, so where's the... How much memory do you have in your computer? Um, I think it's 60 or it's 64. Okay. Yeah. Um, but Zoom just is like really messing with it. Um, Oh wait, we can't see. Let's do like head of GeoSet. Do, do, do. Oh wait, let's do, what was it called? Geolocation? Oh, man, might have to take my word for it that it did it. Um, oh yeah, it was called geolocation, okay. Oh, my goodness. Um, oh, because it was already separated. That's right. Um, well, let's just go ahead and clean this. And then removing the parentheses. This was just supposed to be like a really simple example. <laughs> um, and then converting them to as numeric. Run. Um, and then I, I think for the assignment, I had to just like filter by one of the conditions, which I did arthritis and you had to do it for the city of Baltimore for some reason. Um, so let's just take a look at G. <clears throat> so now I'm trying to figure out where the geolocations are stored in this guy. Oh, it's just lat long, duh, okay. So summary. Okay, so yes, yeah, so now I have like the lat longs in there and they're a numeric type, um, no longer in the parentheses. And and this this was just gonna give us a little bit of a preview of what we're gonna work with next, which was leaflet, um, because I had to make a leaflet map for this assignment. Um I'm just gonna do this color palette quick. This was just assigning the color palette. I wanted these, these risk factors to be um, as reds. And then this is just an example of a leaflet map and we'll go through the different parts of it in a second, but hopefully we'll be able to see it here. There we go. Um, so with those geolocations that I just cleaned up um, using the same thing we did from assignment two, um, it's, it's able to, to kind of color code these, these dots are kind of like the center of each, I believe census block or something like that. Um, and their size and their, their colored is, is referring to like the percentage of people who have um, arthritis, I believe I picked in those locations. So it's supposed to be like sort of a heat map of, of risk in the city of Baltimore um, based on this CDC location data. Um, Again, like that was just the assignment because it was in the School of Public Health. That's just the data we were working with. Um, I'm used to working with species data and um, species distribution. So I think the, the stuff we'll be doing with Leaflet today and um, with GIS APIs is kind of geared a little bit more towards that because that's just sort of like the corner of R that I like to work in, but I was just sort of showing as an example of like the same sort of workflow that we did with assignment two, it does show up a lot. It's nice to just reuse code that you've already done. Like I think I just went to like an assignment two example that I did and was like fixing this like as he was talking about the assignment, because again, this instructor wasn't even aware that the geolocations were like that. Um, so it's kind of nice when you've got some code you can reuse like that. Uh, but that example didn't go as smoothly as I would have hoped. Um, just trying to like prove that it does happen and it happens a lot with um, the lat long data in particular, you get those extra characters in there because of the way they're pulled off the internet or wherever. So anyway, um, so today we're gonna get to working with a few of these um, more advanced packages for 
using R as a GIS. Um, and I think I, I'm just gonna pull up on the, the class site. I, I posted um, the, I think I posted already, uh, the um, documentation for these packages that we're using, if you wanna go take a look at that, along with some of the tutorials that I kind of like loosely followed to make these, these demos. Um, so we're gonna look at like package SP, leaflet, RGDEL, uh, even though we've seen that before. Um, th this is all just the CRAN documentation that you can go to to take a look at that. Um, and you can look up all the different functions. It's basically what shows up in the help window when you search a function. Um, it's referring to this documentation online, but I just wanted to provide that there. And some of the tutorials that we're going to do, this is one that I'm following a lot for Leaflet and R. Uh, we're going to learn about, first we'll do some base maps, um, adding base maps, um, zooming and setting the view of your map. There's adding markers, pop-up labels, and then the, the lines and shapes we'll do. Um, so actually like adding shape files or um, polylines. You saw me do a little bit of that with that example where I added the transect data, if anyone watched that using a loop, um, I added polylines to a leaflet map. Um, but leaflet, uh, I really do like to use leaflet in R because um, it was actually, it's a JavaScript package that was like written and interfaced to R. Um, but it's a lot like, the syntax is a lot like ggplot, only instead of plus signs, you use pipes to like add on the different layers of the map. So I think it's a little more intuitive, for, especially for people who are working in GIS. Um, and then we won't get all like into all of these things, um, all of these different types of projections and like chloropleths and stuff, but they're definitely something you can look into. I'm hoping that I might get into like um, using Leaflet with Shiny. I might show a little bit of that in the next class. Uh, Shiny is a package that lets you um, make web apps with with your R visualizations, which is really cool. And I have done a web app with Leaflet and Shiny before, so hopefully I can show that um, a little bit in the next class where we talk about some of the stuff that goes beyond this course. Uh, but anyway, so we'll talk about Leaflet today, and I'll also do some raster processing stuff with R. Um, hopefully it won't be too slow while I've got Zoom going, but I'm linking to a tutorial here um, on the, the page. Where was it? Uh, Canvas keeps bringing me to the top. Uh, spatial data in R, using R as a GIS. I'm linking to that tutorial where I kind of found some of that um, and then customized it a little bit for this class. Um, and then we'll also work with DISMO, which is a package for species distribution modeling, because that's what I work in, um, and has like APIs for pulling weather data and stuff like, stuff like that. So, um, well, actually it uses the raster package to pull its data. So it's just something that kind of works with these, these different APIs that we're working with that I was gonna show as an example. Um, and it could be used for bringing in species data on Emerald Dashboard if you wanted, as you'll see in an example here. But so I'll go ahead and I've already, I already have these installed. Um, so I'll run my library calls just to make sure here, um, even though we already used Leaflet because I called it in the last example. Um, but just to get started with like a basic Leaflet map, um, I'm not gonna always, I'm not gonna always like type, type in things. Um, I'll just do like L map or something. Um, I'll just do M. But just to show like the first leaflet map, I'll go ahead and type it out just so you can see like each part of it. So a lot like the ggplot um, function, I'm just calling like a blank leaflet map. Um, I'm just calling in leaflet. So leaflet creates um, a zoomable, like an interactive map. So as you saw here, like it was actually like you could actually zoom in on it. Um, it's not limited in its X and Y axis there. Um, you know, again, it, that interactive part is actually JavaScript that's making it able to do that, but there's an interface from JavaScript to R for leaflet. So you can call like this blank leaflet map, and then you can actually add on like elements to the map with the pipe. So rather than the plus, it's the pipe. Um, 
And so this was something like that Alyssa was asking me about because it's a little difficult to set the extent of a map in ggplot um, because it kind of cuts off, if it cuts off certain groupings, um, your groups can get all messed up if they're outside the XY limit. And sometimes you just want to zoom to an extent, but not have like, you know, all of your polylines get messed up. So, you know, they just have like a pretty easy way to set the view um, to a certain to a certain extent when you're working with these leaflet maps. So I think I, I had set it to like approximately where St. Mary's Minneapolis campus is. Um, and I wish I was cool and like could just remember off the top of my head what the long lat is for that. Um, but I have to like write it down because I don't, I don't remember. So set view, you can just set the lat and long or the long and lat. 44.9866. And then the zoom, um, you can specify like how far zoomed in you want it. This is just sort of like centers it on that lat long. And then I'm also gonna say zoom equals 11. And then I'm just going to add tiles to that map. So this is like the base map that you're adding. And I'm going to add the base tiles, which I believe is just open street map if you've ever seen that. Um, so I'm just adding it right onto this leaflet element here that I've assigned to M. Uh-oh. <laughs> What lat long did I put in? <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> I must have like had an error in my, oh, I see. <laughs> it's supposed to be that. Um, Cause I ended up in like Western. That's funny. Hopefully we'll be in Minneapolis now. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so. So now we've got like a basic leaflet map that is centered on St. Mary's location, basically. Uh, so Minneapolis is kind of in the center here and it's set to the, the Zoom 11. I think it's actually like inverse kind of of what you would think. So I think thir like if I change it to 13, it would zoom in uh, closer. But let's see, I always, it's always the inverse of what I think. Yeah, it gets closer. Whereas like if it was eight, um, you get further out. Yeah. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. So that's just your basic leaflet map. Pretty quick to set up. The, the, power, the thing I really like it for is adding the different base maps. So it's much like ArcGIS where you can you, you kind of access to these different base maps. Um, this one, the defaults open street map is what Leaflet defaults to. Um, you can see down there which map it is, but Leaflet also provides this um, API application programming interface for connecting to other types of tile providers as well, um, including, including Esri, which we'll see. So I'll just go down and grab those because I'm not gonna, um, make you watch me type these out because I always have typos. So like, for example, we've got um, this stamen is a, I think an open map source uh, that provides different, different uh, sort of aesthetics for base maps. Um, so this toner one is just sort of black and white, which I've used before. If you just, if you have like a publication that's going to be in black and white only, um, it kind of has very stark lines too. Uh, so it can be good for things that might be printed. Um, that's just an example of one. And also when you type, uh, leaf, since Leaflet's providing that interface, um, it actually starts to autocomplete when you put in this add provider tiles function, and then you do providers, and then the dollar sign accessor, it starts showing you the different, um, the different maps that are provided. So if you can, you can like just explore and take a look at which ones there are. You know, that one's just like a very minimalist graph, I guess. Um, yeah. 
Ooh, watercolor. I want to see that one. <laughs> Ooh. Oh my gosh, that one's cool. Okay. It's not very helpful, but it's cool. <laughs> um, anyway, let's take a look at just a few other ones. Um, I like Cardo DB a lot. That's an open source tile provider. Um, and they make just really, really good simple base maps that aren't too, um, you know, in your face for you so you can map your data on top of them. I think it's, I have a note here to look at dark matter. Cardo DB dark matter. This one's really good um, as a base map if you have like some really bright colorful points, like say you had your emerald dashboard trees in like bright green or something, that'd be a good one to display on top of there if you've got um, sort of a data source like that where it's a lot of points and it, a background could really interfere with seeing that. Um, and then just like want to point out that you've got Esri as well. Um, it's one of the interfaces they provide to some of the Esri maps. There's this Nat Geo world map that I like. Um, so you've got access to some of those base maps as well. What are some other ones? Esri dot, um, I mean, they have a world street map as well. Um, no, there's not a ton of them, like terrain, maybe. Maybe they have like some shaded areas. Oh yeah, that doesn't show up very well, but it's like shaded relief. Interesting. Um, but yeah, so there's there's a lot of different uh, base maps that are provided there. We'll just do. What did I have? Yeah. Um, and then one other thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, you can you can get other tiles rather than just ones that are provided as as a base as base maps um, through Leaflet for free. I did get like a subscription to this Thunder Forest API, which is another base map provider, um, and it was free. Uh, but you can put in this. There's like this options in the Add Providers tile to put in um, this the API key if it requires one. And so I, I just basically signed up for Thunder Forest and got a subscription and got this key. Let's see if it still works. Uh, I had just seen people using this Thunder Forest one and I really liked how it looked. Yeah, so that's just one of the options that they have. Um, there's, oh, there's this funny one. It's like uh, Spinal Map. <laughs> um, this one's really weird. So someone had a lot of time on their hands and made like a base map that was very like hard rock and like all of the water is lava. And so like there's, there's people who just have like a lot of time on their hands and this is like their hobby is making base maps, which I think is wonderful, really. Um, but yeah, transport dark, that'd be nice. Um, so it's kind of if you if you did want to go that direction and get um, some of these services are free to get base maps or or at least a portion of the base maps are free and so there is a way you can put in that API key that gives you access to those um, through Leaflet. So anyway, let's like let's add some data with Leaflet. So. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I wanted to, I, this was in the tutorial, I think, um, looking at the weather data. So this was an API that's pulling weather data from um, this website here. It says add WMS tiles. Um, where was that in the tutorial? I just saw it and like copied it in and it works. It's kind of cool. Um, shoot, I don't remember where it was. But it was somewhere in here, just trust me on that. Uh, and so basically I just copied it in. It's it's adding these weather tiles from this website. Um, let's see. And then there's a attribution label in there even. Um, basically I just copy and pasted this. 
And we can check on the weather right now. So this is like the current weather. <laughs> and that's kind of neat. So that's just another like API um, that you can get through Leaflet for pulling data in that I thought was cool. I mean, not, not particularly useful for what we're doing right now, but um, if you were working on an app for something that needed to pull the current weather data, that would be something to look at, I guess. Anyway, let's add some of our own data, um, like points and stuff. Uh, so let's see. Um, so here we have the, the same map that I just created, um, adding the Thunder Forest tiles. Um, you can you can add anything or you can just do the base tiles that you want. Um, you can do this add markers as well. Let me get rid of this icon here because we don't want it yet. Do that in a second. Um, so you can, with the add markers function, which you just add on with another pipe. So whenever you add an element to the map, you use a pipe rather than the plus that you see in ggplot. Um, and you can add use the function add markers, which is gonna take a lot long. Um, and it by default generates like a teardrop marker uh, with the point uh, end of the teardrop at that lat long location. So let's take a look. I think again, it's like the St. Mary's parking lot or something. That's where it's actually pointing to. So we've added a marker, um, just point basic points data and you know, if you just, if you want to get custom and fancy, I just had an example in here of um, adding a specific picture, like an icon with the icon parameter. Um, you can, so for this one, I decided to put a tree there. I don't know, maybe because you guys are going to be working with tree data, uh, but you can put in like the icon URL, like just the actual image address. If you find one online, I like to find one that's like a PNG with a transparent background. So it looks good on the map. Um, and then you can specify the length and width. The, the anchor, there's icon anchor as well. Uh, you don't have to do that one. That one's just sort of talking about like, like I mentioned the teardrop, the point of it is, um, located at the lat long location is just like sort of changing where uh, where that where it's pointing to but um, and it def defaults to the center of the image so like here's this tree image I pulled from online and then if I map that you can make basically you can make all your points little bugs or trees or whatever you're mapping if you want it so now there's a tree in there um, and if you notice, I added a pop-up too. So the add markers takes a pop-up uh, parameter as well, where you can put some text in there. So you click on it, it's a tree. So there's like a lot of interactive features. It's a lot like working with Esri online maps. Do you guys do that? The, um, we used to work with Esri online map kind of building those web apps with the widgets. It's a lot like that. But okay. So that's just sort of like a little introduction to working with Leaflet. Does anyone have any questions about about Leaflet so far? We're probably gonna fly through these examples a little bit, um, which isn't a bad thing. All right, so now I'm gonna actually put a shape file on there. And um, <clears throat> this was something that uh, I think I, like Alyssa was talking about earlier with me today about, um, you know, adding shape files like that aren't necessarily uh, formatted as the data frame data that we read in, like for USA and state and stuff like that, layering that um, can get a little difficult uh, with ggplot or just the, the base plot function in R. And so hopefully this will kind of show an option that's a little bit easier for using leaflet to do that. So I'm just reading in, I went and got some Minnesota, just the Minnesota County polygons, um, the county shape layer, um, and I'm reading it in with the read OGR. So hopefully that won't take too long. Let's zoom open. 
Yeah, that wasn't too bad. Okay, so we'll just take a look at that with the base plot function. Oh, sorry. Uh, one thing to remember is this is actually in like your viewer tab um, and not in the plots tab because it's like an interactive zoomable map. So the plots tab just showed up with the, just refreshed with the uh, shape file that I just read in. Um, I always forget that and then I'm like, wait, where's my plot? Uh, so it's actually interacting with a different interface on RStudio. Um, so now we have Minnesota counties and what if we wanted to like put those on our leaflet map. One thing you do have to do, much like the first thing you do with ArcGIS, is transform the coordinate system. Um, so I use, I believe this is in the SP package, um, which installs with RGDAL. It installs in the background. Um, but yeah, so if I type in like SP transform, it will tell me. Yeah, it's in the SP package for spatial um, analysis. So transform the projection and data transformation is what it does. So that's what I'm using. Um, and I give it the object I want to transform this shape file uh, because if we take a look at the shape file, um, it says the projection system is the UTM zone 15 NAT 83. And with leaflet, um, we're do, we're dealing with the 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 uh, WGS. We're do, we're dealing with a different ellipsoid, um, kind of the internet mapping, the more internet mapping one. So they won't know to put them together unless we transform them. So I'm just running that on there, and then the CRS parameter is just for coordinate reference system. Takes the string. It's kind of like I had to copy paste the string in. Um, for the ellipsoid that you're using. Uh, so basically like the CRS parameter knows to um, associate that string with which projection system to use. <clears throat> and I think I always get a warning and I ignore it because it still, <laughs> it still works. It's just saying like it, there's a different projection method it prefers or something, but um, we should still get it. So I made another leaflet map that's taking, this one's actually taking the MN uh, shape file as its data. And I'm assigning it to my map. I'm just adding like the base open street map tiles. And then I can use this add polygon function to find the color, uh, the weight, which I think is transparent or like the thickness of the lines. And I can't remember what smooth factor is. So maybe I'll change that and see what happens in a minute. But. Um, so we ran that and I'll do oops, min map. There we go. It's going. So now we have the shape file like on top of our leaflet base map rendering there. Um, And, oh yeah, I was gonna change this. I don't know what the smooth factor is. Actually, change the weight too, see what happens. Oh, I didn't mean to transform it again. Oh yeah, so it's making like the weight of the lines. Oh yeah, I think the smooth factor is like, um, oh, how detailed the the actual lines are. That makes sense because you could make them like really. Oh, it's like what would happen if I just made it like five? Just curious. I haven't really played around with that. <clears throat> And you notice like, haha, then it gets weird because <laughs> it's like the, the number of vertices that it's allowed to have. That's kind of cool. Um, anyway, those are some of the options you can set. I'm sure there's like a bunch more. Um, in fact, like you can just search like add polygons and it will tell you. Um, 
it should tell you like some of the different options that you can set. There's that add WMS tiles for adding the weather data. It's just showing all the different things you can add. Um, where's the polygons? Polylines. Add polygons, yeah. So you can do um, different colors, uh, fill opacity, fill color. You know, we can we can change all of these different things. Um, we could do, we can give them a pop-up. Uh, let's see, like Minnesota probably has some, uh, where it would be like, oh, city or county name or something like that. I think we could give it a pop-up for the counties. Um, I think I'd have to do the paste function because it takes um, it takes like strings and can paste it with like data vectors. Or maybe I can just do pat. We'll just do mn county name. I think that'll work. Yeah, so now I click on the county names and they pop up. Um, and I think you can have them by default. You have to X out of them, but you can have them just like disappear on click as well was one of the options you could set. So I would like if you if you're not sure what different options you can do, I would do that question mark search like the add polygons or add uh, add markers and just see what the different options are because there's a, like a lot of different things. Much like ArcGIS, there's just a lot of different things you can do to change the features and customize them. Let's see. Um, okay, so like let's, let's do a little bit of species distribution stuff with um, the package Dismo that I have in there for species distribution modeling. Um, before I do that, does does anybody uh, feel like they need a break first, or do we want to just like power through this stuff? Because I just realized it was six, almost six thirty. So let's try to power through. Okay, yeah, because I think we can like get through all these examples. Because like I said, the last last uh, last time I taught this class, we had like everyone doing their assignment for presentations and stuff like that. So um, it doesn't get too long here. I do just want to double check that no one's like trying to, um, nope, no one's asking to get into the Zoom meeting or confused about that. Okay. Um, anyway, so now I just want to bring in some points data too um, into our Minnesota map. And um, to do that, I'm actually going to use this Dis Dismo package that I mentioned for species distribution modeling um, and another API. So it's just sort of like a, a tour of some of the APIs I've used. There's, there's a bunch of them, but this is just one of them. Uh, this one is to GBIF. So there's this GBIF function. And I'll just oops, search it here. Um, hopefully it shows up. Um, well, this is being slow, but basically GBIF is this um, open access biodiversity database. Uh, so if I can, I can like search, I'm going to search my uh, species, one of the species I study, a species of weevil. Um, and yeah, so we've got Pseudorhynchus constrictus here. Um, ooh, those are some good pictures. Uh, so it's just a huge database that keeps track of reports from museum records or field observations, uh, basically like that DNR shape file, but for the whole world and for all kinds of species. Uh, so this one's not a pest species, so there's not 
too many data points on it. Um, this is one of the species we use for biocontrol of garlic mustard. Well, it's not approved for release yet, so it's only in Europe right now. Um, but I just picked it because it doesn't have like, like for example, garlic mustard has like 200,000 points and we'd have to like read those all in and that takes a while. So I just picked a species with um, so it's like 200 points or something like that. But, um, but this is the, the actual website that it's pulling from um, and Dismo provides an API for pulling this data. Um, and before I would like go, I would actually like download their Excel files. Like you could go to occurrences um, and download the data and it would come in like a huge Excel or CSV file with all of this like extra information that was kind of formatted weird. And I was trying to like reformat it until I realized that Dismo just provides um, this API that lets you pull the lat longs of any species that's listed in there by their scientific name. Uh, so yeah, so pulled up the description. Uh, it mentions it's in Dismo here in these little brackets. Um, and it's basically just this getter function that takes the genus name and the species name as separate strings. Um, you can define an extent. So like if you had something like garlic mustard where there's way too many points, you could say only within this, this bounding box do I want it. Um, and there's some other options that you can set. Um, remove zeros that's a good one because zeros might throw off like being able to plot the points. Um, but we'll also do something else to get rid of errors that way. Um, but yeah, so basically you just have to make sure that the, the genus species, the genus and species are spelled correctly because those are the two strings it takes. So I'm taking in Pseudorhynchus constrictus and calling that GBIF function and just assigning, it'll assign it to the variable cc and see it says it's pulling the records and looks like it's downloaded um, so it's kind of like that big hairy data set with a bunch of information um, on the occurrence data and where it came from and who recorded it blah 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 we don't need all of that so i'm just going to do a subset of the cc variable where i select the columns for county or country um, and then lat and long because we're, we're mostly going to use the lat long and i store it in the variable locs just for location so we'll take a look at that um, so very you know slimmed down all we really are interested in is the lat and long um, and we might do some mapping of the country later, so I kept that. Um, and then this is something that was like kind of recommended at one point, and I have run into issues with this, um, where like lats get reported long or they're they're above 90, like you can't have a, a lat that exceeds that. Uh, so it's just basically just discarding errors and making sure there's no nothing that would throw it off when you're trying to plot. Um, so that's all that subset is doing really. Um, sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. Um, so yeah, and then <clears throat> there's also this, I think coordinates is in the SP um, package as well. Just setting the lat long of locs. Uh, this probably isn't as necessary because I think if I just plot locs, oh, I see here on basically just telling it that it's coordinates for a base plot. Yeah, there we go. Um, so it's saying that those are the, those are coordinates. And so it basically like, this is, imagine Europe was here. We don't have a base map, but this is like roughly um, what it looked like. So that coordinates function is just defining that they're lat long coordinates. Uh, but we don't wanna just plot it in the base plotting. I mean, you can, but, um, but we want to actually like look at it on a map. So um, to go back to like our Minnesota thing, I decided to, sorry, like switching gears here, but um, I actually decided to get the Emerald Ash Borer points because we'd actually would get some in Minnesota to look at. So let's, let's uh, pull that and then go ahead and do basic, oops, do the same thing with that and start in the variable AP. We'll go back to the constrictive stuff. 
there's a there's a few more records it takes just a little bit longer but it's not too bad um there's actually not that much on gbif with emerald ash borer like you have you have more locations in the emerald ash borer infected trees for the minnesota uh, dnr data but if you wanted to include this data as well for your analysis you definitely could so this just pulled the the locations of emerald ash borer um, stored it in AP and we subset it again uh, so we can take a look at AP loads. Um, like we just have, oh, I guess we didn't have to do country because it's just like, oh, there's Canadian points, I guess. And I think there was like one point too in, uh, in its native range in somewhere in Asia. Um, but I just wanted to grab a species that was actually going to be in Minnesota so we could go back to our Minnesota map and add circle markers. And I'm adding, um, so circle markers is just a different type of marker. It won't default to that teardrop shape. It's just a circle where you could define the radius. Um, and then, I mean, you'll see. And then it also takes lat long uh, radius for the circle, how big it's gonna be. You could also define it based on data, like with that risk map that I did, um, you could have the radius be equal to like the extent of risk or something and make the circles a different size. Um, and then I just said color purple. <clears throat> so now it's mapping that. Oops, I gotta zoom in because I didn't set the view. But we should still see our Minnesota shape file. Why did I choose purple for both of them? It was not a good idea. <laughs> Sorry. But you can see some of those emerald ash borer locations are now on our shapefile. Um, so yeah, it's just an example of adding the points layer on top of the uh, shapefile on top of the base map. So we're starting to like get some real GIS functionality. Um, and I've really been coming to appreciate R as like a light, sort of a lightweight um, GIS that I can use. Um, that like combines, kind of combines that ability with uh, with some powerful data manipulation manipulation tools, which is useful. Okay, so that's an example of pulling species locations using an API. And you know, there's just like there's a ton of different APIs for pulling data. Like that CDC one that you saw was just pulling in data from. I guess it was an API. It was just pulling data from a CDC website. Um, the weather data. You know, I can't even like begin to explain how many different, you know, uh, interfaces there are to data sources for R. Um, but these is just this was just a small portion that I wanted to show you. <clears throat> um, this was another example of setting. Yeah, I believe this was another example of setting the um, a different way of setting the projection. It wasn't really needed here though. Um, it, was, it was needed when we brought in that shape file because we had to transfer it to, to the WGS um, or for, to that ellipsoid that Leaflet uses um, so that it would line up with the base map. Um, but I think I was just trying to provide another example of setting the, yeah, changing the projection of the locs. Let's see what was the locs. Um, oops. Oh, I see, yeah. So it was just setting it to WGS84 using this proj for string function, which I think is in, uh, yeah, it's the SP package as well. So it's the same function that we used to transform it before. Um, See, I have to remind myself which what it's actually for. There's probably like there's definitely probably a difference, just like there's a there's a difference in ArcGIS for like transform and project as well. I think it was just me trying to show like another example of that, but um, we'll see. Oh yeah, it just like created this. Um, proj for string 
um, defining the projection of the points, but we don't really need it because we're just doing the lat long coordinates. Um, anyway, I'll just leave that in there in case it helps someone later if they're trying to change the projection of their points. But yeah, so let's do a map of the Pseudorhynchus constrictus locations that I pulled earlier and plotted so that we can actually see like where they fall uh, with a base map. So I've just created this, you know, empty leaflet plot. I'm um, adding the provider tiles, the Nat Geo world map, and then with a pipe, I can add markers for the um, the locs, which is where we stored the lat long data for the um, Pseudorhynchus constrictus. So, oops, got to got to say CC map because that's where I stored it. And there are those locations with the default teardrop shapes. Um, and I liked the Nat Geo world map because it kind of shows the different countries it resides in very well. Um, okay, and then we already talked about adding the pop-up with the polygons, but you can also do it for your, uh, um, by default, they don't have any, but you can also add pop-ups for your, your markers. Uh, this one, I'm adding circle markers again, um, but still using that low slat long. Um, and then with the pop-up, this is where I use the, that paste function. I think we've used it before. Basically just glues together uh, strings with vectors of data. So this will say C constrictus at, and then with these commas, the paste function can take um, any number of of parameters and kind of glue them together as one string. So it'll say C constrictus at whatever the lat for that marker is and the long for that marker is um, based on the locus data frame. So we'll just map that, play around with it. So now you can click on them and it will actually like say, we could, we could put country in there and like all kinds of things. Um, so, all right, so now we're getting into the raster stuff, um, the raster package, which is fun things. Um, I tried to just kind of keep it to some, uh, some bio, like some weather data, climatic data, that sort of thing. And then we'll look at uh, getting slope and aspect. So some terrain features as well. Um, Cause I feel like that's the data I most often pull for rasters uh, with these APIs. So I'm gonna be using the raster package here. Um, and there's this get data function in the raster package that, let's see. Yeah, it's in the raster package. Uh, so it's basically um, literally like getting data using these APIs and you specify the APIs with the, the string that refers to which one they are. I, I don't know that I like the design of this function very much because um, I feel like maybe there should have been like a, a getter function, a get data function for each type of API rather than like having to get the, the string collect correct in there uh, but really there's just like a get data for like you'll see it's the same one for getting like slope and aspect and you just have to put in the right the right thing that you want to get this one I'm it's you could think of it as like it's almost like the ins packages or install that packages in R like that's kind of a function that's going on to CRAN and like getting the appropriate package and installing it on your machine it's that's the get, get data is just a getter function um, so this one I'm pulling world climb data and I think I pulled up like, so world climb is these uh, bioclimatic variables derived from uh, monthly and seasonal rainfall values and temperature values throughout the world. So it's basically making this interpolated grid using climate sta stations and sort of um, averaging the, the general climate of that area. So they have this like huge grid of climate stations across the world. So like I use this a lot for determining the range of species because the climates have to, um, like for example, like the climate 
where emerald ash borers from in Asia had to line up so that it could complete its life cycle properly and um, where it's present in the US and stuff like that. So it's used for insects a lot in determining their spread since they're so regulated by temperature and rainfall to complete their life cycle and emerge. Um, so that's- Mary, can, yeah. can I ask a question? Sorry. Um, did you just pull that up yourself or was that part of the code? Like, Oh, I just pulled up the website for World Climb. Oh, okay. So like World Climb okay. is like you can actually just like GBIF, you could actually go on the website and like click on the data you want, download this like horribly large folder of data sets, you know, like you could do it manually and get these. Uh, but the raster package has this application programming interface for getting that for you and pulling it into R. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I just pulled up the website. Um, Cause I, it, they're numbered and I always pull up this website to remember what each, each variable. Cause basically each of these like bio one, bio two, bio three, those are all going to be pulled in as a raster, as a grid um, mm -hmm. across the, the, the whole world really, or like whatever tile, depending on the re resolution you pull of a grid of annual mean temperature or mean diurnal range. So like these actually, if you pull in multiple ones, they get pulled in as a raster stack. Um, which is kind of an array in structure and mm -hmm. how it's indexed. You don't really need to know that. Maybe sometimes, but so yeah, so this kind of this get data function within the raster package, it's kind of clunky. Um, but I tell it that I want world climb data and I want the bio. There's there's like other, there's like climate change variables and stuff like this. I want the bio climb variables, which is what we were just looking at. You can specify the resolution. Uh, I mean, it can get pretty, I just have it at the 10 meter resolution. You can get pretty fine resolution. Um, and usually like it'll just pull certain tiles to save on memory and stuff like that. Cause it would be a lot to have like a world grid at the 0.5 meter resolution. Um, and then here I am pulling it, um, I, I'm specifying the, locations that I want to pull that data for. So, which is the locs, the uh, pseudorhynchus constrictus lat longs. So, I'll just run my, um, I think it ran. Okay, and then, like for example, if I want to pull, what was it? isothermality, so it's kind of like temperature evenness, and min temperature of coldest month. I think I just picked two that I wanted to pull. Like I'm just gonna get those rasters so I can just like index them. Um, Cause again, this is like sort of like a stack that it pulls. So I'm like doing like the double brackets to get those specific elements, those specific rasters out of the raster stack, which is essentially an array of rasters, a list of rasters. Um, within that CC climb data that was pulled in. And I'm just gonna store it as the climate variables that I want. Um, and then the extract function is, um, basically it's taking those locations, like our locations here, and extracting the values in the raster cells, those temperature or precip values in the raster cells, where those points intersect with the raster on the globe. Um, so that's what the extract is doing. So that's actually going to get me what the what the bioclimb variables the, um, are like, what the climate is like at those locations. So we'll pull that in. Even it takes a second, depending on how many points you have, basically, how many rasters that you're getting it for. Usually doesn't take this long again. I think computer's a little slow right now. Okay. Um, we could just like take a look at that. CC extract just to see what it looks like. Um, so basically this is all of the points. There's like uh, 245 rows of Pseudorhynchus constrictus points. And then they've got like the values for each of these, um, each, each of these uh, bioclimb variables is what the extract function did. 
And, um, oh, also I should mention, I think like the, all of BioClim variables are scaled by 10, um, I think, yeah. I can't remember. It's something like that. So if you see some of these values and you're like, well, that's a crazy temperature. Um, I think you really have to divide by 10 or multiply by 10. I, I can't remember. Just don't worry about it because they're all scaled to be um, so that they'll be similar and comparable for when we do climate analysis comparisons, um, which is what I'm going to do here. So I'm actually going to use the bioclim algorithm. So there's this list of variables and then a, long, a while ago someone created this algorithm that basically does a similarity index of like it does some it does some math to determine um, a statistical analysis to determine how similar the the bioclimate climatic variables you specify are um, at this you know at this location and then match it to the rest of the world to the grid across the rest of the world and it will give you like basically a heat map of how similar it is to where Sudorinka's constrictus locations are, if that makes sense. We'll see it in a second here. So that's the bioclim function. There's some other ones that are included, like if you've heard of Maxent, um, you can use that. Uh, you have to have Java installed, but, um, and then also like domain, but bioclim's just the easy one just for looking at. So I'll run that, and I'm just calling it CC match because it's, kind of a climate match algorithm. Um, let's see. And then I use this predict function. So this is what's actually going to like match those uh, using the bioclim algorithm. It's going to match those Sudorinkus constrictus locations, uh, you know, across the grid across the world to see how similar it is in um, temperature isothermality and minimum temperature in coldest month is what I specified because uh, I'm giving it climate variables, so just those variables I selected. Um, and then how similar is any location on the globe to, um, to the locations where Sudorinkus constrictus lives. So, oops, I already ran that. Doing the climate match. And this, this one takes like a second, but um, I'm basically just doing this to get a raster. So it's gonna be, so that we can map a raster. Um, it's gonna be a, oh, that didn't take too long at all. Uh, so it's basically gonna be like a heat map of where else in the world, roughly, Sudorhynchus constrictus could live based on those climate factors. So I'm cr creating another leaflet map, um, adding some thunder forest tiles, but you can add whatever you want. Um, I probably shouldn't use that since like if you're running these at home, you might, you won't have fun, the same API key I would have. So I'll change those, but um, I'll just run that. And then there's this add raster image. So I'm adding that, that bioclim um, prediction, and then you can specify the um, transparency, the opacity. So I made it a little bit transparent so we could see the base map underneath. And it might take a second. Okay. Yeah, so um, I, it's just like, I didn't really specify the colors. Usually I make, um, I do like, so this, all this red area is where it's not similar at all. Uh, so I would normally make that transparent or something that, or just NA, like you can specify NA um, so that you wouldn't see it at all and you would see the base map underneath. But, you know, generally this looks about, this looks okay because we remember where Pseudorhynchus constrictus was and it's finding locations that are similar, at least based on those variables. Um, so it's kind of like a heat map of where they might be. Um, it's not great. You know, it's, it, models are, what's the, the saying, like all models are wrong, some are useful. And it's saying that in the US, based on those variables, it would do well like in the app, sort of, I don't know, randomly in Maryland and the Appalachians maybe, and then sort of the Ozarks area. Um, but that's just an example of overlaying a, a raster on the leaflet map. Um, we could make it like more transparent too. 
it might be better. Yeah, it's a little more transparent, I guess. Um, and it's not the greatest resolution because it's kind of pixely, but you know, it saves us time here. So just wanted to provide an example of adding raster data. Okay. What else? I, I don't have that much left to get into. Um, so we're doing well. Um, we'll probably be done early here. Um, but I wanted to show a little bit more raster data, pulling in some raster data, elevation data is one I get. Um, this, so this is the get data function again, and uh, this, the interface to this particular elevation data was just called alt, altitude, I guess, um, is the data source it was pulling from. You know, I just found it online. Uh, there's probably, I think in the get data, in the raster documentation, um, if you go to the get data function, there's probably a list of the different um, APIs it can, or data sources it can pull from. And hopefully they keep that pretty updated. But this one I'm just doing, you know, the altitude data and then I chose the, um, it takes the country's abbreviation. So I chose Switzerland here, um, just because of the Alps, you'd get some cool, hopefully get some cool um, altitude data there. I think it's in the plot. Ooh. Hopefully that worked. I actually haven't run this one in a while. Yep, it worked. Okay. So this was just in the plots. I'm just like plotting it. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, that's some high mountains. So that's pretty. Uh, like you could make that grayscale and do like a shaded relief map that way. Um, I think I do, and then like if we did, um, oh yeah, I think I did Germany, so DE for like Deutschland or whatever. I pulled that just because I wanted to show um, if we plot this elevation two for Germany, I could put the points, I think, of constrictus on top of it. So there's Germany, not as like interesting in elevation. Uh, but I could also plot this plot oaks. Or maybe I have to. Oh wait, I think I need to do. I always forget how to do this. Mm. I don't know. I was just trying to plot the locs on top and I always forget how to do that but I'll figure it out in a second and then do it. Um, oh yeah, and so this is, so the next thing is an example of some, uh, the raster package provides you some raster analysis tools. A lot of the same ones that are available in ArcGIS. Um, so you can run the slope and aspect um, analysis on the raster, the relief, elevation relief. Um, so yeah, so slope is, you know, the slope of the train and then aspect is in like the direction it's facing. Uh, so, so that's kind of cool that it provides that with this terrain function. Um, so I'm giving it the elevation, the Switzerland elevation is what I called that variable. Um, and then I'm setting the options for slope and aspect. Um, and then the unit is degrees. And plot that. Um, there it 
is. <laughs> so now you've got the slope and the the direction and degrees of which of the aspect as well. Um, So those are just an example of some of the same raster processing tools that you can get through the raster package. And then I wanted to show the um, an example of so of doing that the um, oh I'm losing it the the same sort of um, what's it called geoprocessing tools I'm trying to remember what it is in ArcGIS oh I'm drawing a blank um, what's like intersect union you know, those analyses, what do you call the, that group of tools again? Can't remember. Anyway, the ones that you can do for, for shape files, um, though that's provided as well um, through some of these packages. So I've got this like, I, I think it's through the package SP again. Um, so I've got this G union just to show an example of doing a union. So yeah, let's just double check here. Yeah, oh, it's in the, the RGEOS package, that's right, uh, which I installed earlier. Uh, so I think there's G-Union, there's like G-Intersect. Um, so doing like the two, yeah, G-Intersect, sex, is it? Yeah, functions testing with geometries have at least one point in common or no points in common. Um, and then, yeah the G intersection is the functions for determining the intersection between the two given geometries. Um, so like, I don't know, for example, like maybe you had to, for your, your project or something, you had two shape files of like parks and like, um, you know, quarantine areas for Emerald Ash 4 or something like that. And you wanted to figure out where they, they intersect or you want to do a union of them. Um, I think I just, I, you know, just to save time, I just did the, the Minnesota counties again um, and did a union of Ramsey and Hennepin County, which is kind of like useless because it just makes a, a new county shape, which is um, a combination of the two, but I couldn't really do intersect because they don't share geometry. Uh, but yeah, so I just subsetted out the Ramsey County by name and then Hennepin. And just to like show you that it subsetted it from that Minnesota shape file successfully. There's Ramsey, there's Hennepin. Um, and then you can do a spatial union of the two. And then I can plot UN. So I just made like this mega county that's not really a real thing, but just showing that those spatial analysis tools do exist um, through some packages. I'm sure much like RGDAL, there's probably stuff besides RGOS that um, provides the interface to those tools, but um, RGOS is just one that I've seen a lot that I've gotten familiar with. Um, and then I did, the last thing I really wanted to point out, I think it's basically the last thing, um, is this, I wish I had, I always wish that I had mentioned this uh, for doing the assignment three, um, but some people had noticed that it's a big data set that you pull in for assignment three and you do like your invasive species subset, it gets a lot smaller, a lot easier once you pull out the data that you need. Um, I should have at that point, just required if you had your OGR function was working, just like you can read OGR, you can also write OGR, you can write a shape file out of R um, and save the new geometry that you've subsetted. So I should have said like, once you get your shape file subsetted to the species you want, you know, go ahead and write that to a shape file and then read that in because then it won't take very much time. Then you can always just read that shape file in whenever you open assignment three. Um, that would have just been a way around, you know, how long it takes, uh, if that makes sense. But um, I always forget to say that. So here's an example of, of writing a shapefile um, in case you wanna do that to help yourself and save time for your final project. Uh, 
but it takes the the ob the data object Ramsey is the one I'm doing that my Ramsey subset of Minnesota um, then the file path um, of where I want to save it so I'm going to save it in our R class um, inside the shape boundary counties of Minnesota uh, folder which is what I originally downloaded into um, and then call it Ramsey and then I'm telling it I want it to be an Esri shape file so like that's the the type of file it should save and so it will keep all of that information that it has as a shape file with it so hopefully this goes smoothly oh no oh I just I already did this that's why Ramsey you know Ramsey again Okay, so it seems to have saved. So if like I were to go, you know, search, saved it in our class. Um, oh, I saw it for a second there. Uh, no. Oh my gosh, I need to clean these up. Here we go. This should be in here. I think that's where I saved it. Yeah, Ramsey again today at 7.01 p.m. So if you, you can see, like, it wrote it with the DBF, with the PRJ extension, the shape extension, SHX, like everything that it needs it um, because I gave, I specified it as reshape file. Um, it kept all that information with it. Um, so yeah, it's it's just like, you know, reading in a CSV, writing out a CSV, but with shape files and um, RGDAL provides that option. But okay, those are, those are the examples that I wanted to go through. Um, let me just double check our agenda and see how we're doing here. Does anyone have any any questions on these these demos that came that came to mind? Does anyone think that they're going to use Leaflet for their Emerald Dash Warrior project? It's a possibility. <laughs> I used it for internet mapping um, in JavaScript a while ago, and I just like fell in love with it there and was so excited when it was in R. Um, agenda. We did leaflet, adding base maps, pop-up labels, Dismo, raster package, some other geospatial analysis tools, and we already discussed the final project and assignment number four. Um, so like with this stuff, normally when we had like in-person class, um, there would also be time for people to like play around with this stuff themselves as well or work on their final project. But um, like for, for this class, um, it's kind of all happening asynchronously anyway. So I did want to mention that um, I'll still have office hours tomorrow, uh, you know, 5.30 to 7.00. But then after that, since um, we're not having like we're not having new material like as, as far as assignments being assigned, um, people are going to be working on their final projects and they're going to be going different directions with that. Um, I'm just going to do like if you get stuck with your final project and and you need to to meet via Zoom, I'm just going to do like by appointment after office hours tomorrow and not have. Um, let's see, like it would be. I won't, so I won't have office hours like Wednesday the 21st. Um, it would just be by appointment at, at that point. Um, is that okay with that? Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. And then just, uh, you know, just give me like a little bit of, of time to arrange like childcare and all that. It's like if we have a meeting that's after, you know, after work hours, after five, um, because yeah, I would just have to have enough notice to get that together. And um, so like, don't like the night before the projects do, don't be like, we need to meet. Um, 
I just need like a little time. And also like send, send like what kind of questions you're gonna have um, because I, I might need to like read up a little bit on it, like on the issue you're having so that we can get the most out of our time if we do meet. Um, Mary, in addition to the best practices style sheet for our markdown, it would be good to have some uh, examples of somebody who's followed those practices. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to get, that's a good point. Um, I was going to get some of the, um, some of the assignment, I think I could get some of the projects that people did in previous years too, just and just to show examples of projects, because sometimes people are like, oh, I don't know where to start, and seeing um, seeing some examples of the our Markdown documents that uh, that students have created over the past couple of years uh, would probably be helpful, I would think, if I posted some of those. Um, so yeah, I can do some, post some examples, and um, I also need to get access to the um, R markdown files that Jake um, that Jake uh, referred to linked to um, because yeah I, I mean I find that for this class we're not heavy in statistics and people aren't going to be doing a, a ton of statistical analysis but then when they get to their capstone they usually do it in R and they'll be like um, asking me like a lot of details about like the particular GLM they're running and stuff like that so I just felt like you know, it, with that, um, even if it's kind of information overload, just having like the option of learning some more statistics stuff doesn't hurt, but um, yeah, I'll make sure I can get the, the RMD file from Jake as well. He should be back from spring break. Um, no, I thought his presentations were really good. I mean, I thought they were helpful. They're, they're like you said, they were pretty deep, but um, mm -hmm. I mean, there, you could glean some good information from them, too. Yeah, he, he, his, he was a high school um, science teacher. And, like, like, he did all education in, you know, previous to coming to the U of M. Um, so, like, yeah, I was, like, and, and then he, like, minored in, in biostats and TA'd a bunch of biostats classes. So I was, like, I'm going to call you in on this, <laughs> tag team you. Um, but yeah, um, if, yeah, if no one has any questions, um, and it seems like people are cooking on assignment three, I saw that was turned in a lot. Um, Where's your cat? <laughs> she was hopping on my lap and poking me a bunch. Um, I need to trim her nails, but, um, I don't know. I guess I just rejected her and now she's in the corner somewhere mad at me. But yeah, she disappeared. Um, I don't know. I, I remember Alyssa adopted a dog. I don't know if she's if she's still on, if she's got any good dog footage, but I could use some like puppy and kitten footage right about now. My friend just adopted a Sphinx cat, like a hairless cat. And it's so weird, and I just want to pet it, but I can't. <laughs> so yeah, my dog's been jumping on me throughout the class and annoying me, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. She's well, she was just asleep and snoring because she snores a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think um, Ruby, my cat, she's named after the programming language. Um, she. She was like, she was a very quiet cat, very peaceful until the baby started crawling and now she like howls at night and gets upset. <laughs> but I don't know if she's uh, distraught or lonely or what, but her like whole world has completely changed with everyone being home and, you know, some, a toddling toddler chasing after her now, so. Yeah, I've got, I've got three cats, so, oh. as well. So it's like having a puppy is their not it's not their favorite thing right now. So yeah, it's like it takes them a while to adjust to change. It seems. Yep. Okay. I'll so, say. so Mary, Mary, did you say that there is no office hours tomorrow? 
There are tomorrow. Oh. It's just going to yeah. be, yeah. And after that, it'll be uh, oh, just by appointment. Yeah. So I'll have them okay. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to, we're still recording. Oh, I'm going to.